Section 42 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. King Lear, Part 3. Night and Storm. Out into the night and storm hurried King Lear, but little he heeded the darkness or the raging of the elements, for now he was mad, really mad. Amid the howling of the blast, cataracts of rain, the rattle of thunder and blinding flashes of lightning, the old man wandered, bareheaded, tearing his white locks and shouting incoherent exclamations to the whirlwind. Blow, wind, and crack your cheeks! Rage, blow, spit fire, spout rain! Nor rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me nothing. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. Then, his mood altering, he called them the servile ministers of two pernicious daughters, who had joined with them in a battle against an old white head. So he went on, raving wildly, while all the time the faithful fool clung to him, half supporting his tottering steps, and still striving with his jests to divert the mind of his heartbroken master. Meanwhile, friends of the king were working on his behalf. Information had reached the Earl of Kent that there was a secret division between Albany and Cornwall, though the face of it was hidden with mutual cunning. Word had been carried to France of the harsh way in which both these sons-in-law had behaved to the old king, and Cordelia was on her way to rescue her father, and had already landed with an army at Dover. The Earl of Gloucester also, disgusted with the brutal behavior of Regan and her husband, was now on the watch to protect the old man. After King Lear had been driven out into the storm, Gloucester overheard a plot to put him to death. He had once made arrangements to secure his safety, and setting out in search of the fugitives, he found them in a wretched little hovel on the heath, where they had gone for shelter. The poor old man's wits were now entirely gone, and his distracted brain could do nothing but brood over the heartless cruelty of his daughters, which had brought him to this condition. But he was tenderly humored and watched over by the few followers still left to him, and now by their loyalty he was safely conveyed out of reach of his enemies. Gloucester told Kent there was a litter waiting ready, and bade him take up his master in his arms at once and carry him to it, and then drive instantly to Dover, where he should receive both welcome and protection. If he delayed in the slightest degree, the king's life and Kent's, and all who offered to defend him, would assuredly be lost." Thanks to the devotion of his faithful friends, the poor old king was safely conveyed to Dover, but a terrible fate rewarded the loyalty of the Earl of Gloucester. Finding out the part he had played in the escape of King Lear, the Duke of Cornwall, with savage barbarity, had both the eyes of the nobleman put out, and then Regan pitilessly bade her servants thrust him forth from his own castle. A just punishment, however, overtook the brutal Earl, one of his own servants, indignant at his cruelty, refused to perform his bidding. Cornwall, enraged, fell upon the man, and they fought. Regan, coming to her husband's assistance, stabbed the servant from behind, but not before the man contrived to wound the earl so seriously that he soon after died of the injury. King Lear reached over safely, and Cordelia was prepared with her most tender affection to welcome her old father but remorse for the injustice with which he had treated his daughter, and robbed her of her rights, to bestow them on her worthless sisters, so stung King Lear's mind that shame kept him from seeing Cordelia, and he contrived to make his escape from the French camp. Cordelia sent out in search of him, and he was presently found wandering about on the cliffs, all decked out with wild flowers, but still in his madness, assuming the majesty of a king. He was taken back to the camp, and placed in the care of a skilful doctor, who said that the chief thing needed to cure his shattered senses was complete repose. The poor old king was put to bed, and everything was done to aid his recovery. In the tent where he lay, attendants watched so that nothing should disturb him, 
and soft music was played. He had a long, refreshing sleep, and when the moment of awakening came, to the great joy of Cordelia and those who had followed him so faithfully, it was evident that his reason was restored. The first sight on which his eyes opened was the loving face of Cordelia. For a moment the king thought it must be some spirit from heaven, and could scarcely believe that it was indeed his own daughter in flesh and blood. He thought that his wits must still be wandering. "'Where have I been? Where am I?' he murmured, looking round with dazed eyes, while the spectators watched with mute anxiety to see what turn his malady would take. "'I should die with pity to see another thus. I know not what to say. I will not swear these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pinprick. Would I were assured of my condition?' "'Oh, look upon me, sir,' entreated Cordelia with her soft voice, "'and hold your hands in benediction over me. No, sir, you must not kneel.' "'Pray do not mock me,' said Lear in trembling accents. "'I am a very foolish, fond old man, fourscore and upward, not an hour more or less. "'And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. "'Methinks I should know you, and know this man.' "'He looked round in piteous appeal. "'Yet I am doubtful, for I am ignorant what place this is.' Pray do not mock me, for, as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And so I am, I am, cried Cordelia, the tears raining from her tender eyes. Are your tears wet? said Lear, touching her cheeks softly, like a child. Yes, faith, I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. No cause, no cause, said Cordelia. Am I in France? asked King Lear. In your own kingdom, sir, said Kent respectfully. Do not abuse me, pleaded the once haughty king. The good doctor now interposed. He bade Cordelia be comforted. The madness was cured, but there was danger in letting the king brood over what had passed. He must not be troubled with further talking until his shaken senses were more securely settled. "'Will it please your highness walk?' asked Cordelia, with her sweet grace of manner. "'You must bear with me,' said the old man humbly. "'Pray you now forget and forgive. I am old and foolish.' And so subdued in mind and crushed in spirit, clinging to the child whom he had spurned, the once fiery and impetuous monarch was tenderly led away by his loving daughter. It would be pleasant if the story could end here, and if we could leave the tempest-tossed old king in the cherished keeping of the gentle Cordelia. But a sadder fate for both was at hand. The king of France had been suddenly called back to his own land by business which imported so much fear and danger to the state that his personal return was absolutely necessary. In his absence, the French forces were attacked by the British troops of Goneril and Regan, under the command of a treacherous son of the loyal Earl of Gloucester called Edmund. Unfortunately, on this occasion, the British won the battle, and Cordelia and King Lear were both captured. Edmund ordered them away to prison, whither King Lear went joyously enough, for he was quite happy at being again with his daughter. As soon as they had gone, Edmund dispatched an officer to the prison with secret instructions, which he ordered him to carry out at once. Scarcely had this been done when a flourish of trumpets announced the approach of the Duke of Albany, Goneril, and Regan. The Duke of Albany, always of a milder and more merciful nature, had for some time been dissatisfied with the treatment to which the poor old king had been subjected. He was indignant at the Duke of Cornwall's barbarity in putting out the eyes of old Gloucester, and was glad to hear that he had met his just punishment at the hands of the servant whom he had killed for daring to remonstrate with him. Albany now demanded that Lear should be handed over to his keeping, a request which Edmund refused to comply with, giving as pretext that the question of Cordelia and her father required a fitter place for discussion. The Duke of Albany ordered Edmund to obey, saying that he regarded him only as a subject in this war and not as his brother, whereupon Regan interposed 
and declared that she had invested Edmund with full authority, therefore he was quite the equal of Albany. Moreover, she intended to marry him. An angry discussion now arose between the two sisters. Goneril had also taken a fancy to this Edmund, and had not scrupled to lay a plot to get her husband killed so that she might marry him. Knowing Regan's designs, she had added to her crimes by secretly poisoning her sister in order to get her out of the way, and even while they were disputing the drug began to take effect, and in a few minutes Regan was dead. Goneril's husband, however, had discovered the plot against himself, and now he publicly denounced his wife. In ungovernable fury at the failure of her schemes, and refusing to give any answer to the Duke of Albany's accusations, Goneril hurried away and took her own life. Thus miserably perished these two hard-hearted and wicked women. Edmund, in the meanwhile, wounded to death by his own brave half-brother Edgar, who had appeared as a champion to punish Edmund for his many horrible acts of treachery and wickedness, now confessed that he and Goneril had given private instructions that Cordelia was to be hanged in prison, and had intended to lay the blame on her own despair, which had caused her to do this desperate deed. Messengers were sent in haste to arrest this fatal order, but alas, it was too late. As Edmund was borne away, King Lear entered, bearing the dead body of Cordelia in his arms. The old man's reason was again tottering on the brink of madness, and the spectators could only listen in pitying sorrow to his frenzied grief over his murdered child. One moment he mourned her as dead, the next he tried to persuade himself she was still living. He called for a looking-glass to see if her breath would mist or stain it, a proof that she lived, and held a feather to her lips and thought it stirred. The Earl of Kent came and knelt before him, but the king turned from him impatiently, and bent again over Cordelia, where she lay on the ground. "'Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little,' he implored in piteous accents. "'Ha, what is it thou sayest?' He lent his ear to listen, and with eager self-deception tried to explain his failure to hear a sound. Her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low, an excellent thing in woman. Then with a sudden change he drew himself up, and looking around cried exultingly, I killed the slave that was a-hanging thee. "'Tis true, my lords, he did, said an officer who was standing by. Did I not, fellow, said the king proudly. I have seen the time with my good biting falcon. I would have made them skip. I am old now, and these same crosses spoil me. Who are you? Mine eyes are not of the best. I'll tell you in a minute. Are you not Kent? The same, your servant Kent. But the king's last gleam of reason was going, and Kent in vain tried to make him realize the fact of his own loyal fidelity, and that the cruel Goneril and Regan were dead. The king's thoughts were again with his beloved child. And my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life, he wailed in heartbroken accents. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? Thou'lt come no more, never, 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 never. Pray you, undo this button. He made a choking movement at the cloak at his throat, and someone stepped forward and gently unclasped it for him. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her. Look, her lips. Look there, look there. And with a strange cry of mingled joy and anguish, King Lear fell dead, on the body of his dear child Cordelia. And so, with all his faults and follies, which had assuredly wrought out their own bitter retribution, the fiery-hearted king passed into the realm of eternal rest. End of section 42。section 43 of the Shakespeare Storybook。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Othello, Part One, Honest Iago. Brave, generous, 
of a free and open nature, Othello the Moor had won high honour in the state of Venice, for, although dark in colouring and of an alien race, he was one of her most renowned generals, and time after time had carried her arms to victory. When, therefore, alarming news reached Venice that the Turkish hordes were again threatening to invade some of her most valued territories, it was to the Moorish warrior Othello that the Venetian senators turned at once to avert the threatened danger. Othello's frank, valiant nature had won him many friends, but close at hand, where he little suspected it, was one subtle and dangerous enemy. Iago, one of his under-officers, hated him with a deadly venom. Iago was a brave soldier, but a man of utterly unscrupulous character. He had been with Othello through several campaigns, and when a chance for promotion came had hoped, through high personal influence, to obtain the envied position of Othello's lieutenant. In his own opinion, Iago thoroughly merited this post, but when suit was made to Othello, he evaded the petitioners, and finally put an end to their hopes by saying that he had already chosen his officer. And what was he? demanded Iago disdainfully. Forsooth, a great arithmetician, one Michael Cassio, a Florentine that never set a squadron in the field, nor knows the division of a battle more than a spinster, unless by bookish theory, mere prattle without practice, is all his soldiership. But he, in good time, must be his lieutenant, and I, God bless the mark, his moorship's ancient. Burning for revenge, Iago, instead of declining the inferior position of ancient, or ensign-bearer, accepted it, but only to serve his own purpose. In following Othello, I follow but myself, he declared. Heaven is my judge, not for love and duty, but seeming so, for my peculiar end. For Iago prided himself on the skill with which he could conceal his real feelings, and under a mask of the bluntest honesty, he began to work out a scheme of diabolical cunning. There was a certain senator of Venice at that time called Brabantio, who had an only daughter named Desdemona. Brabantio was very fond of Othello, and often invited him to his house, and questioned him concerning the story of his life, the battles, sieges, fortunes through which he had passed. Othello recounted all his adventures from year to year, from his boyish days to the moment when he was speaking. He told of disastrous chances, of moving accidents by flood and field, of hairbreadth escapes, of being taken by the foe and sold into slavery, of his redemption from captivity, and then of his travels in all sorts of wild and extraordinary places. He described the vast caves and barren deserts that he had seen, rough quarries, rocks, and hills whose heads touched heaven, cannibals that eat each other, and queer tribes of savages whose heads grow beneath their shoulders. Desdemona, the gentle dawdler of Brabantio, dearly loved to hear these thrilling stories, and was quite fascinated by the valorous soldier who had passed through such strange experiences. Hastily dispatching her household affairs, she would come again and again to listen greedily to Othello, often weeping for pity when she heard of some distressful stroke he had suffered in his youth. His story being done, she would sigh and swear, in faith t'was strange, t'was passing strange, t'was pitiful, t'was wondrous pitiful. She wished she had not heard it, and yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man, and she bade Othello, if he had a friend who loved her, that he would but teach him how to tell his story, and that would woo her. Upon this hint, Othello spoke. Desdemona loved him for the dangers he had passed, and Othello loved Desdemona because she pitied him. This was the simple explanation of what her father, furious with rage, put down to witchcraft, for he could not believe that his timid daughter could really have fallen in love with such an alarming person as the swarthy moor. But, as Desdemona said, she saw Othello's visage in his mind, and the valour and nobility of his nature made her forget the darkness of his complexion. Knowing her father's violent, unreasonable disposition, and fearing that he would never give his consent, Desdemona quietly left her home one night without consulting him, and was married to Othello. Now was Iago's opportunity. 
finding out by some means what was taking place, he informed a rejected suitor of Desdemona's called Rodrigo, a brainless Venetian youth, and together they went to Brabantio's house, and in high glee rousted him, and told the news that Othello had stolen away his daughter. Having raised the alarm and set them on the trail where they would be likely to find Othello, Iago thought it discreet to retire, for he did not wish it to appear as if he had anything to do with the matter. To Othello he afterwards laid all the blame on Rodrigo, declaring that several times he was so enraged with him that he could almost have killed him for the abusive way in which he had spoken of Othello. Brabantio immediately called up his servants and set out to look for the culprits, but before he found them the mischief was done. Othello and Desdemona were securely married. In the council chamber at Venice, though it was night-time, the duke and senators were holding an important meeting. News had come that a fleet of Turkish galleys was bearing down on Cyprus, and though the rumors were conflicting as to the number of the fleet and its present position, there was no doubt that the danger was imminent, and that preparations for defense must at once be set on foot. Messengers were sent to summon both Othello and Brabantio. As it happened, the latter was already on his way to appeal to the duke to punish Othello, and happening to fall in with Othello, the two arrived at the same moment. Valiant Othello, we must straight employ you against the public enemy, said the duke. Then, turning to Brabantio, he added courteously, I did not see you. Welcome, gentle signor. We lacked your counsel and your help tonight. So did I yours, replied Brabantio, and he proceeded to pour forth his complaint, saying that it was not anything he had heard of business which had called him from his bed, nor did the public anxiety make any impression on him, for his own private grief was so overbearing a nature that it swallowed up all other concerns. The duke, much concerned, asked what was the matter whereupon Brabantio in the bitterest terms accused the fellow of having bewitched his daughter, for, he said, it was quite against nature that she could have fallen in love with him if she had been in her proper senses. The duke asked Othello what he could say in answer to the charge. Then Othello, in a manly but modest fashion, gave a straightforward account of what had really happened, and so convincing were his words that the duke was quite won over to his side, and at the end exclaimed heartily, I think this tale would win my daughter too. He tried to persuade Brabantio to make the best of the matter, but the old senator was relentless. All that he would do was to transfer the blame to his daughter, when Desdemona, on being sent for, confirmed everything Othello had said. Her father bade her say to whom in all the assembled company she owed most obedience. Desdemona, with modesty but decision, replied that she saw a divided duty, that she was indebted to her father for life and education, and that she loved and respected him as a daughter, but even as her own mother had left her father, preferring Brabantio, so Desdemona claimed that she had as much right to leave her father and follow her husband Othello. Brabantio was quite unmoved by this argument. God be with you, I have done, he said roughly, and in a few heartless words he handed over his daughter to Othello. Look to her more, if thou hast eyes to see. She has deceived her father, and may thee, was his final cruel taunt. My life upon her faith, cried Othello indignantly, as he clasped his weeping young wife in his arms. The next question to decide was where Desdemona should stay during her husband's absence. She begged so earnestly to be allowed to accompany him to the war that Othello joined his voice to hers, and the duke gave them leave to settle the matter as they chose. Othello was obliged to start that very night, and Desdemona was to follow later under the escort of his officer, Honest Iago, to whose care Othello especially committed her, and whose wife Emilia he begged might attend on her. If Othello had but known it, Honest Iago at that very moment was already weaving his plans of villainy, and was sneering inwardly at his general's open and trustful nature, which made him so easy to be deceived. The sweetest revenge which occurred to Iago was to bring discord between Othello and the beautiful young wife whom he loved so devotedly. Iago, therefore, determined to set cunningly to work to implant a feeling of jealousy in Othello's mind. 
like many warm-hearted and affectionate people othello was extremely passionate and impulsive once his feelings were aroused he rushed forward blindly in the direction in which a clever villain might lure him and being so absolutely truthful and candid himself he was utterly unsuspicious of falsehood in others iago's weapon was not far to seek and he had moreover the satisfaction of feeling that he would enjoy a double revenge for it was michael cassio othello's new lieutenant on whom he fixed as a fitting tool cassio was young handsome attractive a general favourite especially with women where his graceful manners always won him favour he was already greatly liked by desdemona for when othello came to woo her cassio was his frequent companion and often carried messages between them what then more natural than that a young girl like desdemona should presently grow tired of her elderly and war beaten husband and turned for amusement to this charming young gallant such at least was iago's reasoning and such was the poison which he intended to pour into the ear of the guileless othello end of section forty three Section 44 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Othello, Part 2. Well Met at Cyprus. On the way to Cyprus, a terrible tempest sprang up which scattered Othello's convoy and drove his own ship out of its course, so that, after all, Desdemona got to the island before her husband. Cassio, Othello's lieutenant, had already arrived and had been sounding the praises of his general's wife to the islanders, and when news came that Desdemona's ship had also safely reached port, he was ready with a rapturous greeting for the young bride. "'Oh, behold, the riches of the ship is come on shore!' he cried, as Desdemona approached with Emilia, Iago, Roderigo, and their attendants. Hail to thee, lady, the grace of heaven before, behind thee, and on every hand, and wheel thee round. I thank thee, valiant Cassio, replied Desdemona. What tidings can you tell me of my lord? Cassio answered that Othello was not yet arrived, and for anything he knew he was well, and would be there shortly, and even as he spoke the guns on the citadel thundered a greeting to a friendly sail like a spider who has woven its web iago watched his victims he gloated over the idle chatter between cassio and desdemona and marked as they laughed and talked together how the young man smiled and bowed and often kissed his fingers with an air of gallantry ay smile upon her do he sneered to himself if such tricks as these strip you out of your lieutenancy it had been better you had not kissed your three fingers so oft very good well kissed an excellent courtesy tis so indeed so he went on taking malicious pleasure in the young man's little affected airs which would the more readily lend colour to any suggestions iago chose to bring against him othello meanwhile had landed his joy at again meeting his wife was so intense that he could scarcely express it if it were possible now to die twere now to be most happy he exclaimed for he feared that unknown fate would never again hold in store for him another moment of such absolute content come let us to the castle news friends he went on turning to the others our wars are done the turks are drowned how does my old acquaintance of this isle come desdemona once more well met at cyprus in honour of the good tidings of the destruction of the turkish fleet and of the marriage of their new governor othello a public rejoicing was proclaimed in cyprus and during the space of six hours the whole island was to be given up to feasting and revelry cassio was appointed to watch that evening as captain of the guard and iago saw here an excellent opportunity to take the first step in his scheme of revenge by bringing some disgrace on the young lieutenant he knew that a very little wine such as would have no effect on another man made cassio excited and quarrelsome he determined to lure him on to drink more than was good for him after which roderigo was to find some occasion to irritate cassio 
either by speaking too loud or sneering at his discipline or by any other means he pleased cassio being rash and very sudden in anger would probably strike roderigo which if possible he was to be provoked into doing for out of this iago would incite the islanders to mutiny and get cassio dismissed from his post when therefore cassio entered the hall of the castle to take up his duties for the night iago met him with a great appearance of friendliness and cordially pressed him to join in the entertainment he had provided for some guests montano the former governor of cyprus and some other gentlemen who would fain drink a measure to the health of othello knowing his own weakness cassio at first refused not to-night good iago he said i have very poor and unhappy brains for drinking i could well wish courtesy would invent some other custom of entertainment oh they are our friends but one cup pleaded iago i will drink it for you cassio answered that he had drunk only one cup that night and even of that the wine was diluted and yet he already felt the effects he was unfortunate in this peculiarity and dared not task his weakness with any more what man tis a night of revels the gallants desire it urged the tempter where are they asked cassio his resolution beginning to falter here at the door i pray you call them in i'll do it but it mislikes me said cassio and he reluctantly went in search of iago's guests when he presently returned with three or four noisy gallants who had themselves been feasting too lavishly they had already persuaded him to drink another cup with them iago now did his best to lure them on by calling for more wine and trolling out a jovial song and let me the canakin clink clink and let me the canakin clink a soldier's a man a life's but a span why then let a soldier drink drink an excellent song pronounced cassio whereupon iago sang another which he found even more exquisite than the first so merrily went the minutes that it was not until much later that the new lieutenant remembered his neglected duties by which time his senses were quite confused by what he had drunk when he left iago took occasion to spread a bad impression of him by saying what a pity it was that such a good soldier should be spoilt by the persistent habit of drink in fact that he never went sober to bed this of course was an absolute falsehood but the gentlemen of cyprus believed what iago said montano remarked it was a pity othello were not told of it perhaps he did not know or perhaps his good nature prized the virtue in cassio and overlooked the evil it was a great pity that the noble moor should hazard such an important place as second in command to one with such an incurable fault it would be right to say so to othello not i for this fair island said the hypocritical iago i love cassio well and would do much to cure him of this evil but hark what noise for there was a cry without help help the next instant cassio entered violently driving rodrigo in front of him and beating him montano interfered to protect rodrigo whereupon cassio turned on him and both drawing their weapons montano was presently wounded iago meanwhile had sent rodrigo to run and cry a mutiny and make as much disturbance as possible while iago himself had the alarm bell set pealing and shouted noisily in all directions contriving largely to increase the confusion under pretense of restoring order othello was speedily on the scene and with prompt decision at once silenced the uproar then he asked for an explanation which no one seemed willing to give honest iago that lookest dead with grieving speak who began this on thy love i charge thee iago mumbled some confused excuses which were certainly not intended to deceive the general cassio on being appealed to now completely sobered by the shock answered simply i pray you pardon me i cannot speak montano declared that he was much too injured to say anything othello's officer iago could tell him everything he was not conscious of having done or said anything amiss othello now began to lose patience and knowing the serious danger of such a disturbance in the present unsettled condition of the island he curtly commanded iago to let him know how the brawl began and who set it on 
With feigned reluctance, but with much secret satisfaction, Iago gave an account of what had happened, taking care to heighten his own ignorance of the affair, and ostentatiously pretending to try to shield Cassio from blame. Othello's sentence was short and sharp. I know, Iago, thy honesty and love do mince this matter, making it light to Cassio. Cassio, I love thee, but never more be officer of mine. When Othello and the others had retired, Iago, seeing Cassio standing as if dazed, went up and asked him if he were hurt. Ay, past all surgery, was the mournful response. Mary, heaven forbid, said Iago, startled. Reputation, 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 groaned Cassio. Oh, I have lost my reputation. I have lost the immortal part of myself. My reputation, Iago, my reputation. As I am an honest man, I thought you had received some bodily wound, scoffed Iago. There is more sense in that than in reputation. And he tried to cheer up Cassio by telling him there were ways in which he could recover the general's favor only sue to him and he would soon be won round i would rather sue to be despised than deceive so good a commander with so slight so drunken so indiscreet an officer returned the contrite cassio you or any man may be drunk once in his life man urged iago i'll tell you what you shall do and he went on to say that the general's wife was now the general meaning by this that othello would do anything that desdemona wanted Iago advised Cassio to appeal to Desdemona. She was so good and kind that she always did more than she was asked. If Desdemona pleaded with Othello on his behalf, Iago was ready to wager anything that Cassio would soon be in higher favor than ever. Cassio was grateful to Iago for his counsel, which the latter protested he only offered in love and honest kindness and Cassio resolved early the next morning to beseech Desdemona to undertake his cause. Iago was delighted to find his plot working so smoothly. He knew that the more earnestly Desdemona appealed on behalf of Cassio, the more fuel there would be to feed Othello's jealousy. Thus, out of the gentle lady's own sweetness and goodness, Iago made the net that was to enmesh them all. End of section 44 Section 45 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Othello, Part 3 The Handkerchief. In accordance with his resolve, Cassio appealed the next morning to Desdemona who with all the warmth of her affectionate nature undertook his defence and merrily promised to give her husband no peace until he had pardoned the offender othello approaching at that moment desdemona begged cassio to remain and hear her speak but the young lieutenant was too much ashamed to face his general and left in some haste iago seized this chance to implant the first seeds of suspicion in othello by exclaiming as if without thinking ha I like not that. What dost thou say? asked Othello. Nothing, my lord, or if... I know not what, said Iago, craftily pretending as if he wished to withdraw his words. Was not that Cassio parted from my wife? Cassio, my lord, with an air of great surprise, no, sure, I cannot think it, that he would steal away so guilty-like seeing you coming. I do believe it was he, persisted Othello. How now, my lord, I have been talking with a suitor here, a man that languishes in your displeasure, said Desdemona, coming to meet her husband. Who is it you mean? Why, your lieutenant Cassio, answered Desdemona, and then, with simple eloquence, she began to plead for the culprit. But Iago's remark had ruffled Othello's temper. Went he hence now, he asked abruptly, Ay, truly, so humbled that he hath left part of his grief with me to suffer with him. Good love, call him back. Not now, sweet Desdemona, some other time. But shall it be shortly? The sooner, sweet, because of you, 
said Othello, softening a little. Shall it be tonight at supper? No, not tonight. Tomorrow dinner, then. I shall not dine at home. I meet the captains at the citadel. Why, then, tomorrow night, or Tuesday morning, or Tuesday noon, or night, or Wednesday morning? I prithee name the time, but let it not exceed three days, coaxed Desdemona with playful persistency. And she went on pleading for Cassio with such winning sweetness that Othello could resist no longer. Prithee, no more. Let him come when he will. I can deny thee nothing, he exclaimed and when desdemona withdrew happy at the promise she had extorted he cried with a sudden return to all his trust and affection perdition catch my soul but i do love thee and when i love thee not chaos is come again all might now have been well if iago had not been at hand to pour his poison into othello's ear with diabolical cunning a hint suggested here a half-retracted phrase there an affectation of honesty that seemed always checking itself for fear of speaking too openly, Iago contrived to fix the basest suspicions on Cassio. With subtle craft he made it appear as though everything he said were reluctantly dragged from him, and, as on the night before, while making a great parade of trying to shield Cassio, he succeeded in blackening him with unfounded calumny. Not content with this, he next, in a serpent-like manner, began to insinuate suspicions against desdemona declaring that he would not on any account let othello know what was in his thought and beseeching him in the most meaning tone to beware of jealousy those who were jealous he said lived a life of torture doting yet doubting mistrusting yet loving good heaven the souls of all my tribe defend me from jealousy he ended fervently why why is this demanded othello firing up, just as Iago had hoped he would do. Do you think I would lead a life of jealousy to follow still the changes of the moon with fresh suspicions? No, to be once in doubt is once to be resolved. No, Iago, I'll see before I doubt. When I doubt, prove. And on the proof, there is no more but this. Away at once with love and jealousy. Iago remarked he was glad of that, for now he could show the love and duty he bore Othello more frankly. Then he advised Othello to watch his wife closely, and note her behavior with Cassio, afterwards pretending to draw back, and urging Othello to go no further into the matter, but to leave it to time. So, having succeeded in making Othello thoroughly unhappy, Iago took his leave. This fellow's of exceeding honesty, and knows all qualities of human dealings most skillfully, thought the poor deceived Othello, and then, as Desdemona herself came in sight, innocence and candor enthroned on her brow, for a moment all mistrust melted. If she be false, oh, then heaven mocks itself. I'll not believe it. Desdemona had come to remind her husband that dinner was served, and that the islanders invited as guests were waiting. Othello, who had been greatly upset by his conversation with Iago, replied in such a faint voice that Desdemona asked if he were ill. "'I have a pain upon my forehead here,' answered Othello. "'That's with watching. Let me but bind it hard. Within this hour it will be well,' said Desdemona, holding out a handkerchief beautifully embroidered with strawberries. "'Your napkin is too little,' said Othello, putting the handkerchief from him, where it dropped unheeded to the ground. "'Let it alone. Come, I'll go in with you.' I am very sorry that you are not well, said Desdemona, with the simple wistfulness of a child. When they had gone, the handkerchief was picked up by Amelia, wife of Iago, who was very glad to find it, for her husband had often begged her to steal it for him. But Desdemona so loved the token, for it was the first remembrance Othello had given her, and he had begged her never to part with it, that she always kept it carefully about her to kiss and talk to. I'll have the work taken out and give it to Iago, said Amelia to herself. What he will do with it, heaven knows, not I. I only do it to please his whim. But Amelia was already half repenting of what she had done, before she gave the handkerchief to Iago, and she might possibly have refused to part with it at all if Iago had not put an end to the matter by cunningly snatching it from her with one hand, 
while he pretended to caress her with the other. Directly it was safely in his possession, he dropped the amiable tone he had assumed, and harshly ordered away his wife. Iago was delighted to have got this handkerchief, for he meant to make a wicked use of it. He was going to lose it in Cassio's lodgings, and let the young lieutenant find it, when he would take care that Othello should think it was a present from Desdemona. Iago knew that trifles light as air are to the jealous confirmation strong as proofs of holy writ, and seeing Othello approach, he marked with fiendish satisfaction the cloud of gloom and trouble that rested on his brow. Not poppy, nor mandragora, nor all the drowsy syrups of the world shall ever medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou owned yesterday, he said to himself maliciously. Othello's peace of mind was, indeed, gone for ever, and all joy and interest in life were over. Oh, now, for ever, farewell the tranquil mind, farewell content, farewell the plumed troop and the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell, farewell the neighing steed and the shrill trump, the spirit-stirring drum, the ear-piercing fife, the royal banner, and all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. Farewell, Othello's occupation's gone. Is it possible, my lord? murmured Iago, with feigned sympathy. Othello turned on him with sudden fury and gripped him by the throat. Villain, be sure you prove my love untrue. Be sure of it, he cried, shaking him violently. Iago pretended to be deeply aggrieved by Othello's distrust, and said if necessary he could bring proofs of what he said. Tell me but this, he went on, have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? I gave her such a one. It was my first gift. Iago said he did not know about that, but such a handkerchief he had seen in Cassio's possession that very day. Naturally after that Othello could not fail to believe that Desdemona had given away his cherished gift to Cassio. He took the first opportunity to ask her for it when, of course, she was unable to produce it. She had already been greatly distressed at the loss of her treasure, and now was so alarmed by the violent way in which Othello kept demanding it, that she dared not own it was lost, and only said that she had it not about her at that moment. "'That is a fault,' said Othello, frowning darkly. "'That handkerchief was given to my mother by an Egyptian. She was a charmer, and could almost read the thoughts of people. She told her, while she kept it, it would make her amiable, and her husband would love her, but if she lost it or made a gift of it, her husband would get to loathe her. She, dying, gave it to me, and bade me, when my fate would have me marry, to give it to my wife. I did so, and take heed of it, hold it most precious, or lose it, or give it away were such a calamity as nothing else could match. Is it possible? faltered Desdemona. Tis true, there's magic in the web of it. A sibyl, who numbered in the world two hundred years, sewed the work. The worms were hallowed that spun the silk, and it was dyed in mummy, which the skilful conserved of maidens' hearts. Indeed, is it true? said Desdemona, getting more and more alarmed. Most true. Therefore look to it well, said Othello in a threatening manner. Desdemona still persisted that the handkerchief was not lost, and remembering her promise to Cassio, she most unwisely chose this ill-starred moment again to urge her suit. Her innocent good nature was the final stroke to Othello's jealous wrath, and harshly repeating, The handkerchief! The handkerchief! He strode away in ungovernable fury. Worked up to madness by the diabolical arts of Iago, he saw in his young wife's apparent simplicity and candor nothing but the most clever deceit, and he determined to punish her supposed insincerity in the most terrible manner. End of section 45。section 46 of the Shakespeare Storybook。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。Recording by Jason in Panama. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Othello, Part Four. No Way But This. 
though othello had come to the terrible conclusion that desdemona must die he could not prevent his thoughts dwelling again and again on all the charm and loveliness of his dear young wife this did not suit iago's purpose for he was afraid lest othello should relent before his revenge was accomplished so he did his utmost in every way to incite othello still more against desdemona he cunningly reminded him of brabantio's parting words and said if desdemona had deceived her father in concealing her affection for othello why should she not equally deceive her husband in concealing her affection for some one else she shall not live no my heart is turned to stone i strike it and it hurts my hand said othello then oh the world hath not a sweeter creature nay that's not your way said iago ill-pleased i do but say what she is returned the fellow so delicate with her needle an admirable musician oh she will sing the savageness out of a bear of so high and plenteous wit and invention she's the worse for all this said iago oh a thousand thousand times agreed a fellow then he added wistfully and then of so gentle a condition ay too gentle sneered iago nay that's certain but yet the pity of it iago oh iago the pity of it iago but one might better have appealed for compassion to a tiger in sight of his prey iago knew nothing of pity he had only one aim in view to gratify his revenge if othello would kill desdemona he said he would undertake cassio emilia iago's wife was a sharp-tongued outspoken woman devoted to her young mistress and when she saw how jealous and violent othello was becoming she did not scruple to tell him plainly that he was utterly wrong in his distrust but othello urged on by iago's cunning was now past all reason by this time he was firmly convinced that desdemona's simple sweetness of manner was nothing but the most skilful hypocrisy and that it was his duty to put her out of the world so that she should betray no more people when he spoke to his wife that day after his interview with iago his words were so strange and menacing that desdemona was quite frightened upon my knees what doth your speech import she cried piteously i understand a fury in your words but not the words othello answered with a torrent of angry accusations which utterly bewildered desdemona and then he abruptly left her while amelia vainly tried to soothe and comfort her this good woman was not slow to express her indignation at othello's shameful behaviour and loudly announced her opinion that he was being deceived by some base notorious knave some scurvy fellow oh heaven that thou wouldst make such people known and put in every honest hand a whip to lash the rascals naked through the world even from the east to the west she cried with flashing eyes this was not very pleasant hearing for iago who was standing by and he harshly told emilia she was a fool and bade her be silent then when desdemona appealed to him asking what she should do to win her lord again iago pretended to think it was only a little ill temper on the fellow's part that business of the state had offended him and consequently he was out of humour with desdemona there was some colour for this suggestion for a special commission had just arrived from venice commanding othello to return home and deputing cassio as governor of cyprus in his place iago saw that if he wanted to dispose of cassio there was no time to be lost for iago himself would be obliged to leave the island in othello's suite he therefore contrived to incite his feeble-minded tool rodrigo to set upon cassio in the dark that very night and murder him the attempt however was not successful rodrigo only managed to wound cassio and was himself badly injured in return some passers-by the messengers from venice hearing groans in the street stopped to give help but it was too dark to distinguish the sufferers the next person to arrive on the scene was iago himself with a light and coming across the wounded rodrigo and fearing he would betray his share in the plot he treacherously stabbed him to death cassio was then carefully conveyed away for his wounds to be dressed 
That night, when Desdemona was preparing for bed, a strange melancholy seemed to take possession of her. Amelia, who was in attendance, tried to divert her mind by getting her to join in a little idle talk, but Desdemona's thoughts were running on sad themes. My mother had a maid called Barbara, she said musingly. She was in love, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of Willow, an old thing it was, but it expressed her fortune, and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. And presently, as Amelia helped her to disrobe, Desdemona began singing in a sweet, plaintive key. The poor soul sat sighing by a sycamore tree, sing all a green willow, her hand on her bosom, her head on a knee, sing willow, willow, willow. The fresh streams ran by her and murmured her moans, sing willow, willow, willow. Her salt tears fell from her and softened the stones, sing willow, willow, willow. Sing all a green willow must be my garland, let nobody blame him his scorn I approve. Nay, that's not next. Hark, who is it that knocks? It's the wind, said Emilia. Desdemona listened for a moment, then went on with her song. I called my love false love, but what said he then? Sing, willow, willow, willow. Desdemona's face faltered and stopped. Emilia's duties were done, and, bidding her good night, Desdemona let her depart and presently closed her sorrowful eyes in sleep. Now had come the moment that Othello had chosen for his dark deed, as he drew near and saw his beautiful young wife lying in all the calm repose of innocent slumber, for an instant his soul melted with pity and love, and, bending over her, he kissed her tenderly. But once more he hardened his heart by thinking of the cause that had led him to decide on such an act and a fresh wave of jealous fury suddenly taking possession of him, he seized the pillows and held them over Desdemona until life seemed extinct. There came a furious knocking at the door. Emilia's voice was heard outside, demanding admittance. Othello paused to consider. What's best to do? If she come in, she'll sure speak to my wife. My wife, my wife! What wife? I have no wife. Oh, insupportable! Oh, heavy hour! And Othello, with a heavy groan, hid his face in his hands. Again came the knocking. I do beseech you that I may speak with you, O oh, good my lord! Othello drew the curtains of the bed and unlocked the door. Emilia, in great excitement, had come to bring the news of Rodrigo's death. As she was speaking, a strange sort of moan caught her attention. She knew her lady's voice, and, rushing to the bed, tore aside the curtains help help ho help o lady speak again sweet desdemona o sweet mistress speak a guiltless death i die murmured desdemona oh who hath done this deed nobody i myself farewell commend me to my kind lord o oh, farewell and with a little sigh the gentle spirit passed away Othello immediately declared that Desdemona had spoken falsely. It was he who had killed her. Emilia turned on him with bitterest rage and contempt, whereupon he began to explain his reasons for what he had done, saying that it was Iago who had revealed everything to him. Emilia could scarcely believe such a thing. She shouted lustily to rouse the alarm, and when, among others, Iago himself hurried in, she taxed him with what Othello had said. I told him what I thought, and told no more than what he found himself was apt and true, said Iago brazenly. You told a lie, an odious damned lie, upon my soul a lie, a wicked lie, cried the distracted Amelia, and it was vain for Iago to try to silence his wife. Before every one she proclaimed him for the villain he was. Alas, poor Othello, he began to see he had been tricked but one point he still clung to, the handkerchief. Desdemona had certainly given away his cherished gift to Cassio. O oh, thou dull moor, cried Amelia, the handkerchief thou speakest of, I found by chance and gave my husband, for often with solemn earnestness he begged of me to steal it. 
She give it to Cassio? No, alas, I found it, and I gave it to my husband. Thou liest, said Iago. By heaven I do not, I do not, gentlemen. Furious against his wife, Iago had already tried once to stab her, but she had evaded him, and the other men in the room had protected her. He now made another attempt, which was more successful, and Amelia fell to the ground. Oh, lay me by my mistress's side, she begged, and there, a few minutes later, she died, with Desdemona's song of willow, willow, willow on her lips, and protesting with her dying breath the innocence of her dear lady. Now, indeed, the end had come for Othello, and all the anguish of unavailing remorse racked his soul. Oh, Desdemona, Desdemona dead! His heartbroken wail rang through the room. But it was all in vain now. Vain his agony of love and sorrow. Vain his pleading, vain his scalding tears. Vain the bitter scorn with which he lashed his guilty spirit. Cold, cold, pale and still lay his beautiful young wife, her ears deaf to all voices of earth, and frozen on her silent lips the smile with which she had died. Othello's power and command were taken away, and Cassio ruled in Cyprus, but little cared Othello for this, all worldly ambition was over. As the gentlemen and officers were about to leave the chamber of death, taking Iago with them as their prisoner, Othello, with a dignified gesture, stayed them. Soft, you, a word or two before you go. I have done the state some service, and they know it. No more of that. I pray you in your letters, when you shall relate these unlucky deeds, speak of me as I am, nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. Then you must speak of one that loved not wisely but too well, of one not easily jealous but being wrought, perplexed in the extreme, of one whose hand, like the base Indian, threw a pearl away richer than all his tribe. Set you down this, and say besides, that in Aleppo once, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. And at the last word Othello plunged a dagger into his heart. With failing strength he dragged his steps to the bed and fell on the dead body of Desdemona. I kissed thee ere I kill thee, came his dying whisper. No way but this, killing myself to die upon a kiss. End of section 46section 47 of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano the shakespeare story book by Mary MacLeod Cymbeline Part One A Princess of Britain Daughter of Cymbeline, King of Britain, and his acknowledged heir, Imogene, had fallen into deep disgrace at court, and incurred her father's severest displeasure. Cymbeline had lately married a second wife, a widow with one son and it had occurred to both the king and queen that it would be an excellent plan for imogene to marry this youth but cloten was a clownish ill-conditioned lout and imogene had chosen to prefer as her husband a poor but worthy gentleman posthumus leonatus had been her playfellow from childhood for his parents dying when he was an infant he had been adopted by cymbeline who brought him up almost as his own son though the king queen and cloten himself were enraged at the choice imogene had made and the courtiers were forced to appear as if they followed the royal example not one of the latter but was glad at heart at the thing he pretended to scowl at for while cloten was as one gentleman expressed it 
a thing too bad for bad report leonatus was a man endowed with such outward personal grace and such inward nobility of soul that it would be difficult to find his equal through all the world even as a boy most praised most loved he had come unharmed through the trying ordeal of being a court favorite drinking in all branches of learning as lightly as others do err and the proof of his excellence was evident in the fact that so peerless a lady as imogene had chosen him for her husband but cymbeline untouched by his merits was indignant that his daughter had married a beggar when she might have had the only son of the queen he pronounced the sentence of banishment on leonatus and commanded that imogene should be imprisoned at court under the custody of her stepmother the new queen was a crafty designing woman whose chief aim at present was to secure the future throne for her boorish son cymbeline it is true had had two sons of his own but they were both stolen when they were little more than babies the eldest being only three and the youngest two years old from the day of their disappearance no trace of them had ever been found the princess imogene was now the only child and as cymbeline's heir the queen was anxious to entice her into marriage with her son when this attempt failed the queen did not scruple to plan other and darker means to accomplish her purpose she had some knowledge of medicine and took pleasure in making perfumes and preserves from all sorts of herbs and simples under pretense of perfecting her knowledge she begged from a physician cornelius who had helped her with her studies some most poisonous compounds which would produce a languishing death she said she did not intend to use them on human beings but only on animals to try their power and apply the antidote in order to discover their respective virtues and effects the good physician did not at all approve of such cruel experiments he knew the queen's evil nature and would not trust one of such malice with drugs of so deadly a kind while therefore pretending to comply with the queen's request he really gave her some harmless compounds which would only stupefy and dull the senses for a while but do no ultimate injury it was well that cornelius acted so discreetly for the queen lost no time in putting her wicked schemes into practice when leonatus on his banishment departed for rome he left behind him a most faithful devoted servant called pisanio who was to watch over and attend his dear wife the crafty queen tried to win over pisanio to her interests promising him large bribes if he would influence imogene on behalf of her son but pisanio's steadfast fidelity was not to be shaken seeing that all her fawning friendliness was not likely to achieve her aim the queen tried another method to remove leonatus from her path while talking with pisanio she cunningly let fall as if by accident the little box of drugs which she had obtained from cornelius when pisanio picked it up and would have returned it to her she insisted on his keeping it as an earnest of future good which she intended to bestow on him explaining that it was a wonderful cordial by which she had five times redeemed the king from death the queen hoped that pisanio wishing to do his master good would give him some of this cordial which would certainly prove fatal after the death of leonidas Phimogene still persisted in refusing to marry cloten the queen determined that she too should have a taste of the poison when the way would be clear for cloten to ascend the throne while these things were happening in britain leonatus had reached rome here at the house of a friend philario he happened to meet some acquaintances that he had known in younger days one a frenchman and another an italian called iachimo the frenchman reminded him of a quarrel which they had had on the occasion of their former meeting which he said was of a slight and trivial nature but leonatus with his ripened judgment would not admit that the cause of the quarrel 
was altogether slight. Can we, with manners, ask what was the difference? inquired Iachimo. The Frenchman replied that a dispute had arisen as to which of the ladies, whom each loved in his own country, was to be most praised, and that Leonidas had asserted that his, in Britain, was the fairest, most virtuous, wise, and constant, and that her favor was less easily to be won than the rarest of the ladies in France. That lady is not now living, or this gentleman's opinion is by this time worn out, laughed Iacomo. She holds her virtue well, and I my mind, returned Leonidas. You must not so far prefer her before our ladies of Italy, said Iacomo, still in the same jesting way. But Leonidas was in earnest, and in spite of the good-natured bantering of the others, he persisted in extolling the charms and excellence of Imogene. At their parting in Britain, Imogene had given her husband as a remembrance a diamond ring, which had been her mother's, and which she held very precious, and Leonidas, on his part, had clasped on her arm a bracelet. Iacomo now said laughingly, that if only he had the chance of a few minutes' conversation with Imogene, he would soon win her affection. In fact, he was ready to wager the half of his estate against Leonidas's ring, that there was no lady in the world of whom he could not say the same. Leonidas began to get annoyed, and Philario begged them to let the subject drop. But Iacomo would not give in. He now said he wished he had wagered his whole estate. He would lay ten thousand ducats against Leonidas's ring, that if he went to the court of Britain, he would bring back evidence that Imogene's favor was by no means so hard to win as Leonidas imagined. Leonidas, stung by Iacomo's remarks, and longing to prove the falsity of his assertions, and to punish him for his impertinence, said he would accept the wager, but he would wager gold against Iacomo's gold. The ring he held as dear as his finger, it was part of it. Iacomo accused him of fearing to lose the wager, and said he was wise in declining to risk his ring, which so irritated Leonidas that he accepted the challenge. I dare you to this match. Here's my ring, he exclaimed. I will not have this wager, said Philario, but both Leonidas and Iacomo declared it should go on, and proceeded to settle the conditions, to have them lawfully recorded. Only Leonidas further determined that, if Iacomo succeeded in winning his wager, owing to Imogene's fault or weakness, Leonidas would cast off his wife utterly. She was not worth debate. If, on the other hand, Iacomo's advances were repulsed with the contempt they deserved, Iacomo should answer with his sword for his impertinence. To this Iacomo agreed, and without delay he started for Britain. Arrived at the court of Cymbeline, he was introduced to Imogene as the bearer of letters from Leonidas. She received him with charming frankness and cordiality, delighted to welcome one of whom her husband wrote as bestowing much kindness on him. In accordance with the plan Iacomo had thought out, he replied in answer to Imogene's eager questions concerning Leonidas that he was quite well, exceedingly pleasant, and very merry and gamesome. In fact, he was called the Briton Reveller. Imogene was somewhat surprised, and a little hurt to hear this, for at home Leonidas was, if anything, of a grave and melancholy disposition. I never saw him sad, protested Iacomo, and further he added, Leonidas always laughed loudly when one of his companions, a Frenchman, seemed sorrowful, because he left behind him in his own country a lady whom he loved. Fancy a man sighing for the bondage of any woman, Leonidas had said. It pained Imogene to think that Leonidas cared so little about her, as Iacomo's words implied, but when the smooth-tongued Italian gentleman went on to pity her for the way in which her husband seemed to have forgotten her, and counseled her to take revenge, she began to be on her guard. Revenge? she said. How should I be revenged? If this be true, how should I be revenged? Iacomo replied, 
that if leonidas cared so little about her as to be able to amuse himself happily with all the most riotous companions in rome why then let imogen waste no longer any thought on him but bestow her affection on one who was ready to be her devoted friend and servant he iacomo would never neglect her as leonidas had done imogen interrupted these silky speeches with indignant scorn and ordered iacomo to leave her presence instantly what ho pisanio she cried to summon her faithful attendant for she would not listen to another word from this insulting stranger then with supple guile iacomo suddenly changed his tactics and burst into the most glowing praise of leonidas he implored imogen's pardon and declared that all he had said was quite false and only to test her love leonidas was one of the best and truest of men he sits among men like a descended god he hath a kind of honour sets him off more than mortal seeming iacomo's present words made amends to imogen for his unworthy artifice and she pardoned him and resumed all her former gracious charm of manner i had almost forgotten to entreat your grace in a small request said iacomo as he was taking his leave and yet of moment too for it concerns your lord myself and other noble friends or partners in the business pray what is it asked imogen iacomo answered that leonidas and about a dozen of his friends in rome had joined together to buy a present for the emperor he as their agent had purchased this in florence it was plate of rare device and jewels of rich and exquisite form they were of great value and being a stranger in britain iacomo was anxious to have them in safe keeping might he beg of imogen to take them under her protection willingly and i will pledge mine honour for their safety responded imogen since my lord hath interest in them i will keep them under my own protection in my bedchamber they are in a trunk attended by my men said iacomo i will make bold to send them to you only for this night i must leave to-morrow therefore if you please to greet your lord with writing do it to-night i will write said imogen send your trunk to me it shall be safely kept and faithfully yielded to you you are very welcome end of section forty seven recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 48 of The Shakespeare Story Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Shakespeare Story Book by Mary McLeod. Cymbeline, Part Two. How Iacomo won his wager. The Cave of Belarius. The trunk sent by Iacomo was duly placed for security in Imogene's chamber, but it was no plate or jewels that it contained. That night, when the princess slept, a lighted taper still burning in the room and near at hand the book she had been reading ere she fell asleep the lid of the trunk was lifted and the man stepped out it was iacomo with rapid glance he surveyed the room carefully studying every detail what pictures there were where the window was placed what was the adornment of the bed the arras the figures and the story represented and even this was not sufficient for his purpose. He stealthily approached the bed, and while Imogene lay wrapped in deep sleep, he slipped from her arm the bracelet which Leonidas had given her, noting at the same time, on the pure whiteness of her skin, a little mole with five spots, like the crimson spots in the bottom of a cowslip. Next he took up the book she had been reading, looked carefully at the title, and observed the exact passage in the tale where she had left off then satisfied with his ignoble work he went back into the trunk 
the lid shut with a spring and once more there was apparently nothing in the room to disturb the innocent serenity of the sleeping princess in the morning early came an unwelcome suitor cloten the queen's son had been advised to try the effects of music on the hard-hearted lady who unceasingly repulsed his advances he therefore ordered some musicians to attend outside her chamber window and sing a charming little abode that is a song of the nature of a serenade but sung at dawn to waken the sleeper instead of during the night the song chosen was an especially pretty one with a wonderfully sweet air and cloten hoped it would not fail to touch imogene's heart hark hark the lark at heaven's gate sings and phoebus gins arise his steeds to water at those springs on chaliced flowers that lies and winking merry buds begin to ope their golden eyes with everything that pretty is my lady sweet arise 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 imogene liked the pretty music but she was sorry not to be able to thank cloten properly for his trouble for she disliked him as heartily as ever and vexed by his importunity was forced to tell him so cloten tried to persuade her to give up her husband saying that the contract which she pretended with that base wretch one bread of alms and fostered with cold dishes with scraps of the court was no contract and that the marriage could easily be dissolved imogene furious that this contemptible creature should thus dare to insult the noble leonatus indignantly heaped scorn on cloten telling him that he was too base even to be her husband's groom that he would be too much honoured and be worthy of envy if he were styled the under hangman of his kingdom in short she ended the meanest garment that leonidas had ever won was dearer in her eyes than a hundred thousand men such as cloten imogene had already had cause that morning for grave distress for she had discovered the loss of her bracelet and was greatly upset about it leaving her clownish wooer to brood sullenly over this unusual plain speaking for all the gentlemen at court flattered and fawned on cloten to his face though they roundly abused him behind his back imogene now called her faithful pisanio and bade him tell her waiting woman to make the most careful search for the missing jewel it was thy master's i would not lose it for a revenue of any king's in europe i think i saw it this morning i am confident last night it was on my arm i kissed it i hope it be not gone to tell my lord that i kiss aught but him she ended with a melancholy attempt at a little jest alas poor imogene if she had only known how fatally near the truth came her lightly spoken words at that same moment iachimo was speeding back to rome with his unwelcome tidings at first leonidas took for granted that iachimo must have lost his wager he had an answer ready for everything that the latter could say but little by little the wily italian contrived to make it appear that imogene had been far too generous in the favours and friendliness she had lavished on this stranger he had seen her chamber he said and forthwith he described all the tapestry of silk and silver with which it was hung the chimney was south of the room and the story of the huntress diana was wonderfully carved as the subject of the chimney piece the roof of the chamber was fretted with golden cherubs the andarons on the hearth were two winking cupids of silver each standing on one foot leonidas was forced to admit that all this was true but still he said he did not prove that iachimo had won his wager then with a self-assured air of triumph iachimo produced the bracelet which he declared imogene had taken from her arm to give him leonidas with one last effort to preserve his belief in imogene's love and fidelity suggested that perhaps she had taken off the bracelet to send it to him she writes so to you doth she asked iachimo cunningly but alas imogene's letter which he had himself conveyed made no mention of such a fact oh no 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 it's true here take this too cried leonidas handing iachimo the ring which she had wagered and he broke out into a torrent of despairing scorn 
for the utter falsehood and inconstancy of all women. Have patience, sir, and take your ring again, counselled Filario, who all through this interview had keenly distrusted the plausible Iacomo. It is not yet won. Probably Imogene lost the bracelet, or who knows if one of her women, being bribed, has not stolen it from her. Very true, and so I hope he came by it, said Leonidas. Return me my ring, and give me some stronger proof than this, for the bracelet was stolen. Then the Akimo told of the little mole which she had noticed on the white skin of Imogene, and Leonidas could no longer refuse to admit that he had lost his wager. He had loved Imogene so deeply, so tenderly, he had placed such absolute trust in her perfect goodness and truth, that the shock of discovering her falsehood and inconstancy was a terrible one. All women were alike, he thought bitterly. There was no fault in man that woman did not have in greater measure. Lying, flattery, deceit, revenge, ambition, self-indulgence, covetousness, pride, disdain, luxury, slander, fickleness. Every fault that could be named was found more abundantly in woman than in man. So, maddened by the supposed treachery of his peerless wife, the unhappy Leonidas began to brood thoughts of dark revenge. THE CAVE OF BELARIUS About this time there came to the court of Cymbeline emissaries from the Roman emperor, demanding the annual tribute of three thousand pounds, which Julius Caesar had extracted from the conquered Britons, and which latterly Cymbeline had neglected to pay to his successor, Augustus Caesar. On hearing the demand brought by Caius Lucius, the ambassador, the queen at once took it upon herself to urge Cymbeline not to pay the tribute, and Cloten, in his foolish manner, chimed in with silly defiance and childish insults. With more dignity, Cymbeline confirmed the words of the queen and declined to pay, whereupon Caius Lucius pronounced the declaration of war against Britain in the name of his master, Augustus Caesar. His unwelcome duty done, he was then ready to enjoy the hospitality which Cymbeline courteously offered to him during the remaining day or two of his visit to the court, after which the king sent him with a safe conduct and an honorable escort to Milford Haven, and forthwith began his preparations for war. In the meantime, other messages had also come from Rome, letters to Pisanio and to Imogene. The one to Pisanio contained a terrible command. The one to Imogene filled her heart with joy. She was bidden to set off at once to Milford Haven, where Leonidas stated he was at that time, where he wished his wife to join him. Imogene was all excitement and eagerness to be off. She begged Pisanio with pretty impatience to tell her how quickly they could get to Milford Haven, and chide him for the slowness of his reckoning. Her quick wit at once devised a scheme whereby she could escape unnoticed and in the guise of her waiting woman she contrived to slip out of the palace to where pisanio was ready to conduct her on her journey but alas poor lady on the road to milford haven a terrible awakening awaited her pisanio showed her the letter he had received from leonidas and there she read of the crime of which he accused her and that pisanio had orders to put her to death knowing herself blameless imogene was nearly killed by the cruel words and in heartbroken accents she begged pisanio to strike at once and obey his master's bidding but pisanio indignantly flung his sword away refusing to stain his hand with such a deed he had only brought her thus far he said to think out what was best to be done his master must certainly have been deceived some villain peculiarly skilful in his art had done this injury Pisanio said he would give notice to Leonidas that Imogene was dead, sending some token of the fact, as he had been commanded. Imogene would be missed at court, and that would confirm his words. Why, good fellow, what shall I do the while? Where bide, how live? asked poor Imogene. Or what comfort shall I take in life when I am dead to my husband? Pisanio asked if she would like to return to court but Imogene declared she would have no more of court, or father, or the clownish Cloten, who had so pestered her with his love-suit. 
Bassanio said that if she would not stay at court, she could not remain in Britain. Whereupon Imogene asked, were there not other places in the world than Britain where the sun shone? In the volume of the world, the little isle of Britain was no more than a swan's nest in a great pool. Pisania was glad she was willing to think of other places, and went on to suggest a scheme, daring indeed, but which Imogene was only too glad to accept. This was nothing less than that Imogene should disguise herself as a page, and seek service with the Roman ambassador Lucius, and she could go with him to Rome, where she would be living near Leonidas, and, even if she did not see him, she could hear hourly reports of his doings. Pisanio, with this end in view, had taken care to provide himself with the dress of a page, which he now handed over to Imogene. Lucius was to arrive on the following day at Milford Haven, and Pisanio advised Imogene to go there to meet him, and offer her services, where he would probably accept. Pisanio himself must now return to the palace, in case his absence should give rise to suspicion. But from the mountain top where they stood, he pointed out Milford Haven, and it seemed within easy distance. Finally, before taking leave, he gave Imogene the little box of drugs which the queen had presented to him, telling her that it contained some precious cordial that would cure her if ever she were ill. So the faithful servant bowed farewell to his dearly loved mistress. Poor Imogene set out with a brave heart on her perilous adventure, but the town that had looked so near seemed to recede as she walked towards it. For two days and nights she wandered on, almost spent with hunger, and making the ground her bed. At last she came to an opening in the side of the mountain, which looked as if it were used for some kind of habitation, for a path led to the low entrance. Imogene found it was a cave, evidently furnished for use. At first she was afraid to enter, not knowing what danger might lurk inside. But hunger made her valiant. She called, but no one answered. Ho! Who's there? If anything that's civil, speak. Ho! No answer? Then I'll enter. Best draw my sword, and if mine enemy but fear the sword as I do, will scarcely look at it. Grant such a foe, kind heaven. So, timid and quavering in her boy's tunic, with her short, broad-bladed sword gripped in her trembling hand, Imogene pushed aside the brushwood and entered the cave. She had not long disappeared when the real owners of the cave approached. There was an elderly man of commanding presence, and two noble-looking youths of twenty-two and twenty-three years old. In spite of their rustic and almost savage garb of hunters, there was an air of unmistakable distinction about all three, to the frank brow and free step of the mountaineer. The lads joined a princely grace of bearing, which told of high birth and noble breeding. Their appearance did not belie them, for these boys were no other than the two sons of Cymbeline, stolen in their infancy by a banished lord, in revenge for an act of great injustice. Valerius had been a gallant soldier, first among the best, and much beloved by Cymbeline, by whose side he had often fought the Romans. At the very height of his renown, he was suddenly reduced to the deepest disgrace, not for any fault of his own, but because two villains, whose false oaths prevailed before his perfect honor, swore to Cymbeline that he was confederate with the Romans. Then followed his banishment and his theft of the two young princes, and so for twenty years he had lived this wild life among the Welsh mountains, bringing up the boys as if they had been his own sons, and training them in all sorts of manly exercises. In this new existence, Valerius called himself Morgan. Cymbeline's eldest son, Guadarius, went by the name of Polydor, and the younger, Arvaragius, was known as Cadwall. Weary and hungry with a long day's hunting, and looking forward to a good meal from the spoils of the chase, these three were about to enter their cave, when a sudden sign from Valerius stopped the other two. Stay, come not in but that it eats our victuals. I should think here was a fairy, said Belarius. What's the matter, sir? asked Godarius, the elder son. By Jupiter, an angel, or, if not, an earthly paragon. Behold, divineness, no elder than a boy, 
cried Valerius, as Imogene, alarmed by the sound of voices, came to the entrance of the cave. Terrified at the sight of these newcomers, who, for their part, stood gazing in bewilderment at the strange intruder, she began a hasty apology. Good masters, harm me not. Before I entered here I called, and thought to have begged or bought what I have taken. Good troth, I have stolen nothing, and would not, though I had found gold strewn on the floor. Here is money for my meat. I would have left it on board as soon as I made my meal, and parted with prayers for the provider. Money, youth? exclaimed the elder prince disdainfully. All gold and silver rather turn to dirt, added the second. I see you are angry, said Imogene piteously. No, if you kill me for my fault, I should have died if I had not made it. Whither bound? asked Belarius. To Milford Haven. What's your name? Fidel, sir. I have a kinsman who is bound for Italy. He embarked at Milford, to whom, being on my way, almost spent with hunger, I am fallen into this offence. Prithee, fair youth, think us no churls, nor measure our good minds by this rude place we live in, said Belarius kindly. Well encountered. It is almost night. You shall have better cheer ere you depart. Thanks to stay and eat it. Boys, bid him welcome. At Belarius's words, the two young princes stepped forward, and with the most courteous grace did their best to comfort the timid wayfarer, trying with gentle words to put him at his ease, and saying affectionately they would love and welcome him like a brother. And so, cheered and comforted, and led by the younger lad's arm thrown protectively around her, the poor wanderer entered the rude cave, which love and courtesy made so fair an abiding place. End of section 48. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 49 of The Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Cymbeline, Part Three. Fidel. The absence of Imogene was not long in being discovered at court. The queen secretly rejoiced, for she hoped that Imogene had either killed herself in despair, or gone to rejoin her husband, in which latter case she would be too deeply dishonored ever to return. Either of these would forward the queen's aim, for Imogene being disposed of, she would have the placing of the British crown. Cymbeline was so enraged at his daughter's disappearance that no one dared go near him. But Cloten, meeting Pisanio, as he returned to the palace, forced from him the letter which Leonidas had written to Imogene, telling her to meet him at Milford Haven. This put into Cloten's boorish head a brilliant scheme of revenge. He had not forgotten Imogene's disdainful taunt that she held in more respect the meanest garment of Leonidas, than the noble person of Cloten, together with the adornment of his qualities. Cloten now procured from Pisanio a suit of clothes that had belonged to Leonidas. He intended to dress himself in these, and to go in pursuit of Imogene. He reckoned on finding her at Milford Haven with her husband, where he promised himself the pleasure of slaying Leonidas in front of her eyes, and the very garments she had seen fit to honor so much, after which she intended to drive Imogene back to court, with the roughest and most insulting treatment he could devise. Such was the alluring plan which presented itself to the brain of this amiable creature, but the reality did not happen quite in accordance with the design he had sketched. Following in the track of Imogene, he managed to trace her to the cave which now sheltered her. There, happening to fall in with Belarius, 
and the two young princes, Cloten at once began his usual style of bullying insult. Recognizing him for the queen's son, and fearing some ambush which threatened danger to them, Valerius and Arvaragus started to search for any enemies that might be hidden near, leaving the elder lad to deal with the intruder. The haughty spirit of Guderius was certainly not framed to brook the uncalled-for insolence of this blusterer, and when Cloten addressed him as a robber, a lawbreaker, a villain, and bade him yield thee, thief, Guderius retorted with equal scorn. Hence, he said disdainfully, thou art some fool. I am loath to beat thee. Thou injurious thief, hear but my name and tremble cried the silly youth. What's thy name? Cloten, thou villain. Cloten, thou double villain, be thy name. I cannot tremble at it, said Guderius contemptuously. Were it toad or adder or spider, it would move me sooner. To thy further fear, nay, to thy utter confusion, thou shalt know I am son to the queen, said Cloten braggingly. I am sorry for it, not seeming so worthy as thy birth. Art not afraid? demanded Cloten. Those that I reverence, those I fear, the wise, answered Guderius. At fools I laugh, not fear them. Die the death, cried Cloten, springing at him. When I have slain thee with my own hand, I'll follow those that even now fled hence, and on the gates of Lud's town set your heads yield rustic mountaineer but the rustic mountaineer had no intention of yielding and it was the head of the foolish cloten that presently paid the penalty for its owner's blustering insolence safe in the love and protection of her unknown brothers imogene had lived for some days in their cave making bright the rude dwelling with little womanly graces her new friends had taken her straight to their hearts, and in especial, Arviragus, the younger prince, felt for this stranger a deep attachment which he was unable to explain. But all united in praise of Fidel. Valerius noted his noble bearing and gracious manners, which spoke of good breeding. How angel-like he sings, put in Arviragus, and Guiderius commended the daintiness of his cooking, which served dishes fit for the banquet of some goddess. But there came a day when Imogene could not attend as usual to her little household duties. She was very ill. Valerius bade her remain in the cave, and said they would come back to her after their hunting. Guderius offered to remain at home with her, but Imogene would not hear of it. So, with many parting words of affection, at last they left her. Remembering the little box of drugs that Pisanio had given her as a wonderful cordial, Imogene now resolved to try its power. But instead of curing her at once, the effect, as the good physician Cornelius had foreseen, was to send her off into a heavy sleep which seemed exactly like death. On the return from hunting, Arviragus, running into the cave to look for Imogene, found her lying on the floor, her hands clasped, her right cheek reposing on a cushion. Thinking her asleep, Arviragus took off his rough brogue in order that he might tread softly. But alas, he soon found that no step or voice could awaken Fidel from the smiling slumber in which he lay. Stricken with grief, the two princes prepared a beer to carry their dear young comrade to the place of burial. Arviragus saying that while summer lasted, and as long as he lived near, he would sweeten the sad grave with fairest flowers. Then, as they bore him on the bier, they spoke in turn a tender dirge, for their hearts were too full of grief to allow them to sing it. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages, Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone, and ta'en thy wages. Golden lads, 
and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust fear no more the frown o the great thou art past the tyrant's stroke care no more to clothe and eat to thee the reed is as the oak the sceptre learning psychic must all follow this and come to dust fear no more the lightning flash nor the all dreaded thunder stone fear not slander censure rash thou hast finished joy and moan all lovers young all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust no exorciser harm thee nor no witchcraft charm thee ghost unlaid forbear thee nothing ill come near thee quiet consummation have and renowned be thy grave grief for the loss of imogene had for a moment caused the death of cloten to be forgotten but belarius reminded the young princes that after all he was a queen's son and though they had killed him as a foe they must bury him as a prince fetching the dead body therefore they placed it not far from the bier where imogene lay and strewed both with flowers soon after the mourners had retired imogene woke from the sleep into which the drug had thrown her as she recovered her dazed senses she presently became aware that near at hand lay a dead man and recognizing the garments of leonidas she at once took for granted that it was indeed her husband who had been thus cruelly slain struck to the heart by this new sorrow she flung herself half fainting on the body and there soon afterwards she was found by the roman general lucius pitying her desolate condition for he thought this lad in his page's dress was weeping over his dead master lucius took imogene into his own service on hearing of cymbeline's refusal to pay tribute the roman emperor lost no time in sending over an army to enforce his demand the rival forces met near milford haven not far from the cave of belarius hearing the noise of warfare belarius first suggested flight to the upper mountains for better security but the noble spirit of the two young princes scorned such cowardly counsel and they boldly demanded to throw in their lot with the british in fighting the enemy of their country leonidas also at this crisis had returned from rome and disguised as a poor soldier he fought in the ranks of the british meeting iacomo who was commanding the roman troops leonidas fought with him on the battlefield and vanquished him the proud roman was deeply mortified that a noble knight like himself should be overcome and disarmed by one whom he imagined to be a low churl repentance for the base way in which he had behaved to imogene stirred in his heart he thought it was the guilt and heaviness of his own soul that in this combat had unnerved his manhood and enfeebled his arm as for leonidas he fought in reckless despair his grief for imogene's murder which he believed pisanio to have carried out making him long for the death which seemed to shun him the valor of guderius and arbaragus had soon an opportunity of displaying itself the british sorely bested were in act of flight and cymbeline had been captured by the romans when belarius and the two princes went to his assistance and with the aid of leonidas succeeded in rescuing the king by their desperate courage they drove back the flying britons and forced them to rally and resist the foe and finally achieve a brilliant victory after the skirmish some british soldiers coming across leonidas took him for a fugitive from the romans and put him into prison leonidas was ready to welcome bondage for it was a way as he looked at it to liberty death was the key that would unbar those locks 
his conscience was more heavily fettered than his limbs it was not enough to be sorry he longed to die for imogene's dear life which she had stolen from her he would gladly yield up his own when therefore the jailers came the following morning to lead him forth to death leonidas told them he was more than ready he was merrier to die than they to live another messenger arriving with an order that his fetters were to be knocked off and that he was to be conducted to the king leonidas followed him willingly believing that at last the moment for death had come cymbeline was seated in his tent and at his side stood his three preservers the aged warrior with white flowing beard and the two gallant striplings a fourth was missing and cymbeline lamented for him a poor soldier he said who fought so nobly that his rags shamed gilded arms and yet one who found him should receive the highest favor from the king no one could give tidings of this hero but cymbeline proceeded to confer the honor of knighthood on the three other champions and to appoint them companions to his own person with dignities becoming their estate at this moment there came an interruption cornelius the physician entered he brought the news that the wicked queen's life was ended and that before her death she had confessed all her villainy her duplicity towards imogene her intention of poisoning both her and cymbeline in order to secure the crown for her own son the strange disappearance of cloten for whose sake she had wrought so much evil and the consequent failure of all her schemes made her grow desperate and so in despair she died cymbeline could not but be moved by the account of this unsuspected treachery on the part of his wife for she was as beautiful in person as she was wicked in mind and he had been quite deceived by her his thoughts now began to turn with tenderness to the innocent daughter whom he had treated with such unjust severity lucius the roman general was next led as prisoner before the king he was ready to accept with manly dignity the doom of death which he presumed would be meted out to him but he petitioned as a last favor that the life of his little page might be spared never master had a page so kind so duteous diligent so tender on occasion so deft and careful pleaded lucius he hath done no Briton harm though he hath served a roman save him sir and spare no blood beside lucius's general plea was scarcely needed for cymbeline touched by some deep feeling which she could not explain had already been won over to the boy's side and now not only granted him his life but said he might ask what favor he chose even if it were to demand the noblest prisoner taken lucius naturally expected that fidel would take this opportunity to beg for his master's life but imogene had seen iacomo standing among the other prisoners and noticing on his finger the diamond ring which she had given to leonidas she begged as her favor of the king that iacomo should be bidden to say of whom he had received the ring iacomo who had long bitterly repented of his unworthy deed now made a true confession of all that had happened lavishing praise on leonidas and his peerless wife and heaping all the blame upon himself leonidas who had been standing in the background unable to contain himself when he heard how cruelly he had been tricked would gladly have killed iacomo on the spot and then died himself with grief and shame oh imogene my queen my life my wife he cried frantic with despair at the tragedy he had himself wrought oh imogene 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 but happily the calamity was not past remedy imogene herself was at hand and soon everything was put right Valerius restored to cymbeline the two boys stolen in infancy and in the joy of finding them again cymbeline pardoned the offender 
i lost my children he said if these be they i know not how to wish a pair of worthier sons the young princes welcomed with rapture their dear young comrade fidel whom they had mourned as dead and who was now given back to them as their own beloved sister to caius lucius the roman general cymbeline with royal generosity announced that though the victor he would henceforth pay to augustus caesar the rightful tribute he demanded which his wicked queen had dissuaded him from doing the poor soldier whom cymbeline was desirous of thanking turned out to be no other than leonidas his own son-in-law even iacomo met with mercy in deep contrition he knelt before leonidas saying humbly take that life i beseech you which i owe you but your ring first and here the bracelet of the truest princess that ever swore her faith kneel not to me said leonidas the power that i have over you is to spare you the malice towards you to forgive you live and deal with others better nobly doomed pronounced cymbeline we will learn generosity of our son-in-law pardons the word to all End of section forty nine. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida.